Uh, this afternoon, we have a panel with um, three, five speakers, and uh, we're dealing with the topic of the practical examples of connecting um, organizational research into um, healthcare delivery. And our first speaker is our own Sally Weaver, and we we're very happy that Sally uh, decided to come and work with us. She's had a huge influence on a lot of our thinking. Sally's uh, work here f focuses on teams' initiatives that aim to improve the outcomes and experiences of people facing cancer through research, uh, examining uh, learning in cancer care and transitions um, across the cancer care continuum. All right, well, I hope everybody had a nice lunch, got to talk with some new colleagues and hopefully catch up with some old colleagues as well. Um, to kick off this afternoon, uh, Erica asked me just to talk a little bit about a couple of examples of organizational variables and organizational factors in care delivery research. So to start off, I just want to start by um, showing Steve Taplin's multi-level model that Erica showed earlier today. Of course, this is a comprehensive framework outlining all of the influences on quality cancer care and cancer outcomes all the way from, uh, what am I touching? from patient and family supports all the way through state and national health policy. Um, of course, very familiar to many folks in this room. And so I like to show it, though, just to show that most of my previous work in my portfolio really focuses on these two green circles, so provider team level research and organizational practice setting research. And of course, I'm preaching to the choir here. These are clearly only two levels in this comprehensive model, but they are incredibly important because they exert influence on a range of care delivery processes and outcomes. This afternoon, I hope we can dig a little bit deeper and start to think about some of these organizational variables and characteristics in terms of organizational structure, process, and outcomes. So, of course, on this slide is one great framework for thinking about these kinds of different variables that was developed by Elizabeth Yano and her team at the VA, likely very familiar to many folks in the room. And it outlines and really kind of, I think, provides a nice heuristic for thinking about some of these organizational structure variables. So some of the things we've talked about today, like size, academic affiliation, configuration, leadership structure and authority, and differentiating those from organizational process variables, like care management processes, referral procedures, communication and teamwork processes, and then in turn, of course, thinking about organizational outcomes, so clinic quality metrics and some of those pieces that we've talked about earlier today. And I share this just as an example, um, heuristic for thinking about some of the example papers that I'll talk through this afternoon. Um, and just in the interest of time, I'm not going to dig into the nitty-gritty details of the studies that I'll talk about, but really just highlight some of the key organizational variables and outcomes that they looked at in order to give you just a little bit of a flavor for the panel. Um, one thing that Erica did ask me to do was to talk a little bit about some of the uh, work I did in my prior academic life that focused on understanding the effects of organizational safety culture and teamwork on hospital-acquired infections. I had the great opportunity to work with Dr. Jill Marsteller on a lot of this work, so I'm incredibly glad that she's here today. Um, this first example is a study that we did um, in the ICU that found that ICU safety culture is associated with central line-associated bloodstream infections. Um, this was uh, data that came from the On the Cusp Stop BSI project, which was a national ARC dissemination and implementation collaborative that was implemented in over 1,000 ICUs across the United States. And when we looked at the data, we saw that CLABSI rates were over 57% higher in units that had what we called a conflicting climate or a conflicting culture shape. So these were units where there were really strong, immediate supervisory expectations around patient safety and quality, but there was really less hospital-level support. And so while there was interest in this, there wasn't really the capacity to implement change. Uh, rates were also higher in units that displayed what we termed a non-punitive climate or culture shape. And so in these units, there was an attempt to be blame-free when it came to medication errors, but really less confidence in the capacity to make improvement, uh, to implement improvement actions. The second example is a study in which we found that culture modified or moderated the effect of a team-based quality improvement intervention on surgical site infections. And these, again, were data from an ARC-funded uh, national DNI collaborative focused on uh, their safe program, safety program for surgery. 
The intervention was uh, the Comprehensive Unit-Based Safety Program, which may be familiar to some folks in the room. It's a team-based quality improvement intervention that pairs both a clinical practice bundle with the team-based implementation component. When that was implemented, we saw a 25% reduction or so in all sites, surgical site infections across uh, the hospitals that implemented. Um, but colon SSI was more challenging. We only saw about a 9% reduction when it came to colon SSI. When we took a look at the data, there was still significant between hospital variation after we controlled for some of these more typical organizational structure characteristics. So things like hospital size, volume, things like location. So we wanted to take a di deeper dive and look at some of these more organizational behavior variables and uh, looked at clim uh, safety climate in particular, and lo and behold, what we found was a very significant moderation effect where hospitals in which uh, safety beliefs were aligned with safety behaviors, those were the hospitals that were more likely to reduce their colorectal SSI rates post-implementation. So, of course, uh, also pulled quite a few cancer-specific examples, so please forgive me, they're likely well known to many of the folks in the room. Um, but this next example is an older systematic review that was done by Rebecca Price and Steve Taplin back in 2010. They looked at 73 studies that um, looked at uh, the relationship between organizational factors and screening rates, and they looked at both the structure characteristics, like those you see here on the bottom of the slide, as well as organizational screening processes. Across these 73 studies, they actually identified 40 discrete organizational factors that were investigated. And while they found relatively little uh, compelling evidence that some of these organizational structure variables were associated with screening rates, the evidence was a little bit more clear that rates were really being driven by some of these organizational processes. So strategies related to limiting the number of interfaces across organizational boundaries, so things like offering on-site same-day screening, no surprise there, um, processes related to patient recruitment and referral, as well as processes related to promoting continuous patient care. This third example is a nice pair of papers looking specifically at colorectal cancer screening in VA primary care practices, again by Elizabeth Yano at the VA. Um, they did a very nice primary care director survey where they looked at three domains, practice centralization, practice resources, and practice complexity. And what they found was more guideline concordant screening was happening in those practices that had greater autonomy over their internal structures, more clinical support, and surprisingly, in clinics of smaller size. Uh, they replicated this in a larger study looking at breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer screening and found very similar results. Of course, as we've heard throughout the day, complexity is key. These delivery structures are getting much more complex with the growth of ACOs, patient medical homes, and other um, payment and related governance structures. So again, I think just echoing some of the comments that have been made earlier today, it's so critical to think about these organizational factors at different levels. For example, looking at both clinic level and ACO level characteristics. And this is a nice study that Melinda Davis and her team at OHSU did um, where they looked at both levels using a comparative case study of 16 Medicaid ACOs. They really were aiming to understand the ACO clinic partnership and how ACOs were working with clinics to improve colorectal cancer screening practices. Not surprisingly, they found that about 86% of the ACOs had implemented processes to reduce some of the structural barriers for patients. So again, that on-site same-day screening where you're not having to go across multiple systems. 78% had taken on um, the uh, uh, work of tracking clinic performance data and sharing that back with practices. We can probably have a healthy debate about the effectiveness of that given Brian's talk earlier today. But, um, and 50% had actually taken on the work from clinics of providing patient reminders. They also used um, qualitative interviews to look at some of these key factors influencing the clinic ACO collaboration and some unintended consequences. Moving from screening into other parts of the continuum, this is a next example is not cancer specific, but it is a nice review that was done by Isabel Scholl and Sarah Cobrin and a couple of others, where they looked at 48 papers examining the organizational characteristics um, that were associated with shared decision making. And across these 48 papers, they identified six categories of organizational characteristics, including organizational leadership, culture, teamwork, resources, workflows, and others. But then they also took things a step higher to look at health system level characteristics and found things like, of course, no surprise, incentives, policies and, gui policies and guidelines, and healthcare provider education and licensing. 
This work is also happening in palliative care. I think it's important to emphasize. Um, this is a nice paper that was done by Robin uh, Whitney and her team at the University of California, San Francisco. And they looked at both organizational level and patient level predictors of rehospitalization among patients with advanced cancer in the year post-diagnosis. They uh, looked at over 25,000 people, thanks to the California Cancer Registry, and found that over 71% were hospitalized at least once in that 12 months post-diagnosis, and 16% had uh, three or more hospitalizations. But in terms of the organizational predictors, discharge from a hospital that had, no surprise, had an outpatient palliative care, they saw a 10% reduction in uh, rehospitalization rates whereas rates were actually 33% higher among those who were discharged from a for-profit hospital. This was interesting, I think, in the study because these effect sizes were on par with some of the individual level predictors that they found in their study. And um, uh, their rates in this particular case were not associated with things like the typical structure characteristics, size, teaching status, and the like. So last but not least, I'd be remiss if I didn't follow some of our plenary speakers uh, examples and point out two papers that applied um, different types of organizational theory to care delivery research. Both of them were pre-read materials, but just in case you missed them. Um, the first example is a really nice piece of work that was done by Sarah Birkin and her team of collaborators, many of whom are here in the room, um, where they retrospectively applied four different organizational theories to really try to understand how and why organizations interact with their external environment and how that influenced the adoption, implementation, and sustainability of safe care. Safe care, um, for those who are not aware, is an evidence-based behavioral parent training model that was implemented in 23 U.S. states. Again, I won't dive into the details. If you're interested in talking more about these, join us for discussion group one this afternoon. Um, in the second example, um, this is a paper where myself and Sylvia and several collaborators, we um, adapted a classic organizational behavior theory of coordination, the Okaizen and Becky coordination framework, and really married that with a newer theory of multi-team systems to try to unpack and understand some of the coordinating mechanisms and integrating conditions that really matter when it comes to coordinating chronic care. So in closing, of course, there's many examples of organizational variables in care delivery research. I think, you know, as we've heard both in this talk and in the others this morning, while some of these organizational structure characteristics like size or academic affiliation are easier to measure, they may not necessarily be, um, or they may have weaker or less direct associations with some of the outcomes we're interested in. So there's definitely lots of opportunities, I think, for us to improve and enhance our measurement of organizational processes in our care delivery research. Um, and in that vein, one way to do this, of course, is to draw from some of these organizational theories um, and organizational behavior theories, particularly when we're thinking about conceptualizing and testing some of these mechanisms of action, so some of these mediating variables, and also conceptualizing and testing some of these moderating variables that will help us understand what con in what context these different interventions work best. So with that, I will stop here and turn things back over to Paul. Great. Thanks, Sally. So we are going to have all five panel speakers at the end for some time for discussion, but we'll move through the, the presentations first. So, um, so next, um, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Elizabeth Bieber, who is an epidemiologist and senior uh, staff scientist in the Cancer Preven Prevention Program at the, at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, as well as uh, the scientific director for the Population-Based Research to Optimize the Screening Process. Uh, initiative that I have the pleasure of working with her on, um, as well as uh, Dr. Jasmine Tiro, who is an associate professor in the Department of Population and Data Sciences at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, as well as the associate director for Community Outreach, Engagement, and Equity for the Simmons Comprehensive Cancer Center. And they're going to be, uh, as well as being also the, the um, uh, contact PI for the PROSPER cervical um, research center. So they're going to talk about their experiences and the challenges to developing organizational measures across the different healthcare systems that are involved in the PROSPER network. Welcome. Oh, okay. And Erica would, excuse me, as they, as they come up, Erica would, uh, wanted to remind you, please jot your questions down. Okay. 
Some, someday I'll follow instructions, right? Um, but, but Erica also wanted me to remind you to write your questions down for the panel discussions as, as we go. And again, there's the easels on the back with Vanna there. Um, oh, now I made everybody look at you. Sorry, one. Um, but but uh, welcome, Elizabeth and Doug. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Erica, and others for organizing this workshop. I'm Elizabeth Bieber, and later I'll be joined by my colleague Jasmine Tiro. And what we're going to do is share one example of the challenges that we've experienced working in a NCI-funded consortium, a large consortium, trying to conduct organizational research. I'm going to start with our and we really want you to consider these in the breakout sessions that we're going to have later this afternoon. The first take-home message that we have from our experience is that it's um, important to have common definitions and levels of analysis when you are embarking on doing cross-organization, cross-healthcare system research. Our second take-home message relates to the scope, and having a narrow scope increases feasibility for data collection, and we found it also increases the number of organizations that are able to participate in work that's, that requires data collection at the organizational level. And then finally, changes over time are important. Organizations are constantly evolving, and despite them being challenging to measure, it is important to consider them when you're planning your research studies. As Paul mentioned, uh, Jasmine and I are leaders in the PROSPER Consortium, which stands for the Population-Based Research to Optimize the Screening Process. And this, uh, this consortium aims to better understand and improve the cancer screening process, really in community healthcare settings. So, so last year, NCI funded 10 different healthcare organizations and one coordinating center to study cervical, colorectal, and lung cancer screening processes. And listed here at the bottom, these healthcare organizations, so the 10 organizations, are incredibly diverse. I've listed the different types of settings, and we heard a little bit um, earlier today about the diversity of structures of healthcare organizations. So in PROSPER, we have managed care organizations. For example, there are Kaiser Permanentes involved, um, mixed model systems, such as at Kaiser Permanente Washington. There are primary care networks. And there also is an integrated safety net healthcare system that serves uninsured individuals and underinsured individuals. And the, one of the key goals of PROSPER is really to evaluate the multi-level influences, including or, organizational level factors, on improving the quality of cancer screening care. So when thinking about organizations, our first step was to have a definition. What, what do we mean when we say healthcare organizations and we're going to compare these? Well, earlier, Jose shared with you the definition of health systems that ARC developed through the compendium work. And what we did is we just adapted that definition a bit. Um, you'll see the, you don't see the word hospital in the definition. We had a system that didn't own the hospital. So our definition of a healthcare organization is right here is the facilities and provider teams connected through common ownership or joint management to deliver healthcare. Organizations in the U.S., as I said earlier, are incredibly complex, and that's related to having different structures and different protocols and different cultures. And I'll show here again the types of healthcare settings involved in the PROSPER Consortium. These reflect the diversity of settings in the U.S. And also, though, they demonstrate, for example, the managed care organizations, the incredible amount of diversity even within one type of setting. We started with a multi-level framework, framework when we wanted to think about factors that might influence the cancer screening process. And when I say cancer screening process, here at the bottom, uh, you can see where it begins at risk assessment. So looking from risk assessment all the way to detection, diagnosis, and then treatment. And we agreed from the start that there were numerous factors that occurred at multiple levels that could impact the cancer screening process. And by levels, for example, I, it would be the provider level or facility or system level. 
And so from the start, there were factors that clearly mapped to a specific level. So for example, the training of a provider is clearly at the provider level. But what became really clear is over on the right, when looking at um, there are factors that could be at multiple levels, for example, screening policies and incentives. And the relevant level actually may depend on the structure of the healthcare organization. And now I'll give just a brief, brief example of how um, we tackled screening policies and incentives. So a key question is, can we measure organizational factors in a comparable way across these healthcare settings? So for the example of screening policies and incentives in roles, we can think about two different healthcare organizations. There's organization A, and in this organization, there, there are organization-wide screening policies, and those apply to all the clinics. So in the green, the policies are the same at all the clinics. And also in this organization, there's this management department that implements the policies and the programs. But in contrast, at organization B, here, each clinic, which is in, now in a different color, determines the screening policies and incentive programs. And at these clinics, there's no centralized population management. And so there may be some clinics that have a champion for cancer screening, but it's not a clear delineated role within the, in the clinics. So the question that we're left with then is, what is the appropriate unit of analysis when we're trying to compare the effect of policies and incentives and roles across these different organizations. So, um, you know, PROSPER is really uh, a, a labor of love of stakeholder engagement, right? Because PROSPER, um, people were committed towards measuring cancer screening and people were committed towards um, understanding that organizational factors are important. However, we didn't know who we were going to be playing in the sandbox with when we got funded, right? And so PROSPER um, had to do stakeholder engagement, right? We had to build consensus amongst the 10 organizations, recognizing with the, the, the prior model that we are all different and that what is true for organization A is completely not true for organization B. So how do you, you know, match those various um, institutions when technically you would have actually designed a prospective study completely differently because the units of analysis for comparison would have been different for organization A versus organization B? Um, and, and how would you now design your approach given the fact that you're, you have organizations that are essentially apples and oranges, okay? Um, so our consensus building approach was really about building consensus about which organizational factors could be measured given our different organizational types, and two, how we could measure them in a feasible way um, given the resources that we had in the consortium. So as a result of that consensus building process, we really focused on factors that were closer and more specific to the cancer screening process. And it really speaks to um, what Sally was saying earlier on, yes, we can measure various structural elements, and we do want to measure certain structural elements because we do want to quantify and enumerate the degree to which you know, certain groups of our organizations are apples and the other parts of our organizations are or oranges. But beyond that, we wanted to get more specifically into the cancer screening process and we could get more um, consensus around narrowing the scope and focusing here at the top, you see on, on, on organizational domains one through four. Um, limiting that scope also increased the feasibility and the ability of our health organizations to agree to participate in the study and this is an ongoing process as we have a meeting later this week to, to make that um, more finalized. Um, and, and in part because the end game goal is to say, if we can measure these, can we then link it to our patient level electronically health derived, record derived data. Now, I, we highlight for you two um, domains that we actually chose not to measure, quality improvement and culture and climate, and really store, um, delve down into issues of feasibility. Um, uh, particularly in terms of culture and climate with the need to measure teams um, and how that culture and climate uh, might um, be and which unit of analysis to measure the teams at, right? Um, and, and we weren't 
to do that with, with the level and scope that would be necessary given the type of organizations in our system. And so we're launching our key informant interview in 2020, uh, pending approval um, at, this, uh, at this October meeting. Now, you know, our third take-home point really is about healthcare organizations constantly evolving. Um, and so measurement is, of course, challenging. I mean, you know, we can put a cartoon up there, but all I can tell you is that at Parkland, ask what month it is and what's changing and, and what are the incentives and, and the various pushes and drivers that are causing that healthcare system to change. Um, are there structures, their priorities, their staffing, their policies, their incentives are constantly in flux. And so given the fact that PROSPER was gathering a lot of record data from 2010 to 2021, what does it mean that we are measuring organizational factors in 2020 and ascribing it? Um, and the extent to which we can expect our key informants to be able to pinpoint in time historically certain major changes happened. For example, when did you switch from PAP with reflex um, to a co-testing? Um, and can you see um, the, the cascade of how quickly that change in policy, was it enforced um, by your healthcare system? Can it be enforced by the structure of your healthcare system? Um, and those questions that then can be tied with patient level data. And so um, we acknowledge that there is a challenge with the fact that we are collecting our organizational factors at the end of our retrospective data collection period. But you know, in keeping with um, some of the talks that we've heard this morning, um, I think there's some other additional issues that have bubbled up um, among the Prosper Consortium that I think are important to note as we talk later this afternoon. First of all is, you know, not only were we engaging in stakeholder engagement among the 10 Prosper organizations, but we were also engaging in stakeholder engagement with the clinical stakeholders, right? And so how do we align our research goals with what healthcare organizations value? Uh, they value things beyond HEDIS, although sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Um, but that in itself is a really important piece of stakeholder engagement that we have to be attuned to when approaching them and understanding how they're responding to things. In addition, the next question is, how much are we attuned to incentives at broader policy levels, as Greg was mentioning, um, um, and regulations, right? Because we talk about it in terms of carrots and sticks, right? What are the carrots and sticks that incentivize um, our healthcare organizations to improve their delivery of the cancer screening processes, as well as their decision making on what things they adopt and what things they don't adopt. Um, coming from Parkland Health and Hospital System, which is the safety net system in the Prosper organization, the other thing that I really try to identify is that Parkland is unique among the safety nets across the country and that is a higher resource safety net system, right? And so the extent to which our findings generalize beyond um, into lower resource healthcare settings like community health centers who for delivery of specialty care downstream cancer screening processes require transfer into other systems is really important to, um, to think about as, as Dick mentioned in his question earlier today. Now finally, the, the big thing that we really also want to think through is we were committed towards measuring things at the organizational level but for certain organizations that have more autonomy at the provider and team level, um, how much or how can we account for healthcare provider and teams and their ability to affect variability in our cancer screening outcomes? Um, and, and Jennifer will be talking about that more in the next talk. So um, we started this talk trying to help you understand what we think are the take home messages in, in, that we embarked on in trying to convince 10 organizations to measure something next year. Um, uh, what that something is, we'll be able to tell you much more specifically at the end of this week, and um, stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine and Elizabeth. That was very excellent. And to continue along with the practicality of trying to do um, organizational research, uh, next speaker, Jennifer Huss, who is a um, a primary care physician. She is the Peter Gross Chair of Primary Care in the Division of General Internal Medicine at Mass General Hospital and Harvard School. Um, and her research focuses on implementation and evaluation of based interventions to improve the use of screening and prevention in primary care and how healthcare information technology can improve the flow of information between patients and providers. 
So along this line, she, her talk is going to focus on care coordination, the tension between the primary care physician and the, um, the specialist. Jennifer. Great. Uh, thanks for having me. I think I'm here to provide the clinical perspective uh, and uh, give an example of tried to meld the different worlds of uh, specialists and generalist physicians. Um, so in terms of disclosure, I am a practicing primary care physician, so um, if my talk is biased in that direction, you'll have a, a little bit of a sense as to why. Um, so particularly in the world of cancer screening and prevention, although this is definitely true in many areas of medicine, um, we're getting better evidence all the time, and this has allowed for us to come up with better guidelines, more uh, individually tailored guidelines, and coupled with that, uh, more precision-based uh, therapies and recommendations for screening. Um, and so this is wonderful. I think it allows us uh, from moving in lockstep on the left, all being treated exactly the, the same, to be um, able to be kind of realized as the individuals uh, we are uh, with all of our clinical characteristics and health beliefs and preferences. Um, but I think this brings with it um, a level of complexity and implementation that we have only uh, yet begun to grapple with and have not grappled with it um, very effectively at all. I think the downside of this is that um, I think that um, we've been um, also, we're also very interested in addition to sort of um, outcomes really maintaining equity and I think that the uh, downsides of this very personalized approach is if we're trying to spend all of this information getting people into the exactly uh, right buckets that that can detract from some of the other larger goals that we have in healthcare. So in terms of the tensions between specialists and generalists, um, I think that there's a real value in our different perspectives. So I think specialists operate in very siloed worlds. Uh, they have tremendous depth of experience and depth of knowledge, but not a tremendous breadth of knowledge. In contrast, primary care physicians uh, treat patients holistically. We need to think about all of their conditions um, sort of simultaneously, way risk benefits across a number of uh, disease conditions or preventative um, interventions. And so um, as an example, you know, breast cancer, where I've uh, have, uh, spent a lot of time doing research, breast cancer specialists are really interested in um, the perfect breast cancer uh, risk prediction model. I'll talk a little bit about that more on the next slide. As a, as a primary care um, physician, I'm really worried about uh, a woman's risk of heart disease, and maybe that is really where I want to spend my time. And uh, so I'm not going to be able to do sort of complicated risk assessments across a variety of conditions. Um, so this is uh, one example of that. Uh, so uh, this slide uh, shows two breast cancer risk prediction models, uh, the breast cancer surveillance consortium model, which is really um, intended to be sort of a population-based model. Um, it has been shown to perform pretty well for sort of the average risk woman uh, in the population. Um, uh, this is uh, an example from their uh, web-based uh, tool. It's pretty simple to collect. It doesn't, um, you know, collect some information about family history, but on a very kind of high level. Um, in contrast, uh, there's actually a typo on the slide. It's Tyrokuzik. Um, it shows a much more complicated family history-based model um, that is really good for um, categorizing risk among high-risk women. But if you actually administer this tool in average-risk women, it will actually overestimate their um, their uh, estimate of risk, and so uh, you actually may uh, cause more women to sort of uh, be uh, placed in the wrong bucket. But if you're a breast cancer specialist, you're seeing a di different population of women, you're seeing a much higher risk population of women, in contrast to a PCP who's seeing average risk women are trying to sort of pull the needle out of the haystack. Uh, and so uh, this is an area where, um, you know, really you need to use a different risk-based model. And I think the other thing is the model on the right is much more complicated and time-intensive to collect. And so if you're trying to implement it in a primary care practice where you're also trying to um, assess risk for lots of other conditions, um, it would never be feasible. So I think this is a great example of where health systems really can come together and try and create health information technology resources to try and allow this kind of reflex risk assessment where perhaps um, risk factors are collected in tandem 
but then um, there's sort of a reflex risk assessment to a different type of tool if a woman is found to be at higher risk. Um, so uh, this uh, com uh, complexity brings lots of challenges um, as well to um, implementation, and some of this complexity is shared across generalist and specialist groups. Uh, so this is taken from the ASCCP uh, website. They published uh, draft recommendations for uh, cervical cancer uh, screening and surveillance uh, earlier this summer. And um, it is a risk-based uh, algorithm that requires tremendous knowledge of information about prior screening history and results. And so I think uh, the final guidelines haven't come out yet. Uh, but, um, you, you know, requires knowing a woman's history over very long periods of time or women get put into a much higher risk bucket if history is unknown. And so I think this is a complicated algorithm for anybody um, to implement in practice. Perhaps if you're a specialist really focused um, just on cervical cancer screening, you may, be, you may have an incentive to use the web app that they're developing, um, but this is going to require a lot of data entry over uh, years of a woman's history. But I think it also encourages um, specialists and primary care physicians uh, to really work together with EHR vendors, as an example, to try to create uh, stored information across healthcare systems so that this type of information is accessible. Perhaps solution is giving women personal health records so that they can store this information over time um, so that it can then be presented in an electronic format, which would allow the risk assessment to happen in a much more uh, timely and well-integrated way. So I'm going to spend the last few minutes of my talk uh, talking about um, a project that we're working on now. It is called MFOCUS. It is focused on um, improving the follow-up normal cancer screening test. Uh, we know at this point that we do pretty well at offering screening uh, in our healthcare systems, uh, rates of uh, screening across all of the four major cancers that are currently approved by the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force, so cervical, breast, uh, lung, and colorectal cancer are pretty high. I think lung um, is kind of slowly getting there um, as we figure out who to identify who is really at risk and needs lung cancer screening. But we do a pretty good job of getting people in and getting them screened. Um, where we really fall down is on the following abnormalities. And so the table on the right uh, shows data that is derived uh, from a, a paper that Anna Tosterson worked on in Prosper One and also some additional data from our healthcare system. Um, and uh, you know, basically what it shows is that we don't do a great job. I think for breast cancer screening, uh, we do a pretty good job with the, bi the high risk abnormalities, so the BIRAD 4 and 5 abnormalities, largely because of the MQSA law, which um, mandates that radiologists actually track those women down. Uh, but the BIRAD 3 abnormalities have a much longer follow up period, and we don't do such a great job uh, with those or with many of the other abnormalities. Um, and so the evidence suggests that our ability to follow up on these abnormalities varies at uh, different levels. So there are patient factors that affect follow-up, uh, there are provider level factors, clinic level factors, organizational level factors, um, and there's really poor coordination between primary care doctors and specialists, um, and these handoffs in, in information are often key. So the goal of our study um, is to um, improve uh, the follow-up of these abnormal cancer screening tests. It is a study uh, that is being done across three uh, primary care networks, as I'll show you um, in a second. Um, it is uh, sort of primary care centric in that it addresses all four of the cancers uh, screening tests in our healthcare systems. Um, it is designed as a fail safe, so it's really intended to supplement whatever current care is, and we're spending a lot of time uh, trying to define what that is. Um, uh, we are offering uh, both visit-based and uh, population-based outreach and support. Um, so it is a uh, clinic-level randomized trial. Um, we are enrolling 40 practices at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and uh, Dartmouth Primary Care Networks. Um, there are a few key components. Uh, we have been working very closely with our um, EHR teams to develop a bunch of different IT enhancements, uh, largely to identify these folks and track them uh, over time, uh, to um, provide uh, support for um, patients as well as providers 
so uh, we're going to uh, be doing um, both automated outreach and personalized outreach to patients uh, and automated outreach to providers, uh, both uh, primary care providers as well as specialist uh, providers. Um, we are doing some team level enhancements to try and improve communication uh, between uh, patients, uh, primary care providers, and specialist providers. Um, our primary study outcome is going to be uh, completion of um, the appropriate follow-up test uh, for whatever the abnormality is. All of these abnormalities require different time frames of follow-up, and so the outcome is going to be tailored to the specific abnormality for the specific cancer screening test. Uh, and uh, you'll see that the four arms are, the first arm is standard care, um, and as I mentioned, we're going to be doing uh, both uh, qualitative and quantitative work to define what the standard of care is um, at the time that we launched the study and then periodically across uh, the period of um, enrollment. Uh, the second arm is going to include uh, what we're calling sort of visit-based reminders. The third arm includes uh, visit-based reminders as well as a population health management component. And these are sort of going to be uh, rolled out sequentially. Uh, and then the fourth arm includes uh, patient navigation where we can also sort of uh, try and intervene on uh, social barriers to care. So uh, in summary, I think that there are lots of challenges to care coordination um, across primary care. And let me add in terms of the, of the uh, this has been a concerted effort between uh, both primary care providers as well as um, relevant specialist providers for each of the cancer types. I think we've also um, needed to understand uh, what the complexity is of systems uh, used on the specialist end um, and, and sort of where, who, who sort of owns the responsibility or feels like they own or don't own responsibility for managing the follow-up test. Um, so in terms of challenges to coordination, I think we are increasingly complex information. I think primary care providers and specialist physicians see different types of patients. Um, with different risks, and we need to sort of think about how to manage that thoughtfully. Um, we don't have tools currently for shared decision making for patients um, with their providers. Uh, providers in different types of settings face different demands. As a primary care provider, I see a, a patient every 10 to 15 minutes, um, and so that's uh, very tough to sort of uh, do risk assessment across a variety of different conditions. I think we often have lack of role clarity in terms of is it the responsibility of the person who performs the test to follow up on it, or does the primary care physician have responsibility to follow up on all of the abnormalities? Um, and I think, as I mentioned, we really have poor systems in place for the follow-up of abnormal cancer screening tests. I think we, one of the reasons that we do a pretty good job for cancer screening in general is that we're paid on the basis of completing screening, and so our healthcare records have pretty good reminder systems in place for doing that. Um, but we don't have great systems in place uh, for tracking the fault of abnormality. So, thank you. Jennifer, our last for this session is Dr. Jill Marsteller, uh, who is a professor of health policy and management and an associate director for quality and patient safety for the health services outcomes research at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, Jill specializes in estimating the influence of structural and organizational variables on continuous learning in hospitals and in primary care. And she's going to be talking about uh, practical applications of interventions designed to influence organizational leadership. Welcome, Jill. Not learning. Need a learning intervention. Yeah. Um, so thank you, everybody, for being here today. I'm looking forward to talking to you about something other than that. Okay. We're going to talk about the um, practical application uh, of some interventions designed to influence organizational leadership. And a lot of this work comes out of the Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety and Quality, um, as well as the Center for Health Equity, which uh, used to be one of the centers for population health and health disparities, and is now a health equity center. So we're going to try to describe some methods that target change in the entire organization or in more than one organization with a focus on leadership. And I thought I'd talk quickly about two that have sort of been tested and reported in the literature, um, and then there are a couple that are underway currently that I thought I would mention as well. 
Um, and just to uh, get us started, you know, if we were to try to break these down, um, when we're talking about executive walk rounds and simulation, lean leadership program, and so on, um, what are these? What is the uh, function? So the function is that we are essentially trying to engage leaders, right? The second piece is building capacity, typically. So building in the building capacity area, we're really typically that's education that's provided in a, in a leadership program. Um, we are also trying to increase the uh, interaction between the front line and the leader, typically with these kinds of programs, and so that goes to high reliability theory in terms of deference to the front line and awareness of operations and those uh, specific uh, features. Um, and in addition, um, we're, we're oftentimes um, beyond just engaging and, and uh, create, building this capacity this link between the front line and the um, actual demonstration uh, is the piece that we think is really going to engage the front line as well as provide the pass through of the knowledge you gave the leaders down into the front line, right? So it's, that's, that's kind of the theory behind um, these specific kinds of interventions. So you guys have all probably heard of these executive walk rounds. Um, Sally, a few years ago, did uh, an overview of or a, a narrative review where she was looking essentially at what was changing, what was found to change safety culture. And in particular, uh, executive walk rounds was one of the few things that actually seemed to demonstrate some actual effects on changing safety culture as an intervention. Um, so the intervention engages organizational leadership directly with frontline care providers. The idea is that the executives or senior leaders visit the frontline patient care areas and they observe and discuss current or potential threats and problems, provide support to the frontline staff in addressing threats, try to find out what they're worried about, try to create that human connection as well. And it's a way for them to show or demonstrate their leadership commitment to safety to foster that trust and psychological safety. So it's operationalized in various ways, um, which makes comparison across studies kind of difficult. Um, and there's somewhat mixed evidence on executive walk rounds, um, but all of them found improved staff perceptions of safety. And so that um, has a certain level of utility um, all by what, you know, how people feel, not just where you're, whether you're uh, de facto safety or not. Another one that um, was conducted through the Armstrong Institute in specific was a leadership simulation training. And I thought this one was neat because it's a little bit different than some of the leadership training that we um, oftentimes will see. Um, as a simulation, um, the case was that there was a new, that they were a new CEO, they were posing as a new CEO who had to save the hospital with the, from its failing safety record. And so um, the scenario gave a certain set of accountability structures that were part of this organization. And then they would interview confederates of the study who would, talk, would ha uh, either be a consultant or be actual frontline staff. And so they would interview those folks and gather information and then make some decisions as a team so 55 senior le healthcare leaders participated. They were organized into eight different teams and it lasted four hours. And they practiced their skills in analyzing the impact of direct and delegated executive involvement, um, developing alternative accountability structures and processes, uh, and also identifying and prioritizing patient safety improvement goals. Um, so a couple of the uh, outcomes of this study were that none of the teams actually developed the same strategy or the same approach. So this is just a, another, you know, uh, contribution to the theme that we have going through today, which is there is no one size fits all, right? Um, and they all had gaps, of course, as well at various levels of the organization. So nobody did a complete multi-level, every single level uh, intervention. Um, and, but in general, the participants were satisfied, so they went home happy. Um, one of the programs that I wanted to try to delve into a little bit that is um, actually a uh, ongoing project is the Lean Leadership Program that's developed um, within, has been developed within the Johns Hopkins Hospital System. 
So lean management itself is defined as the practices and tools used to monitor, measure, and sustain the operation of lean production operations, and that's from MAN. So the core elements that are emphasized in lean management are standard work for leaders. So the structure and the routine is created for spending time in the workplace uh, with a process focus and you're trying to achieve targets. Um, the visual controls are included, so methods for making process performance visible in the workplace, uh, comparing actual performance to target performance. And so some of the ways that this is operationalized is with, uh, for example, they call it a true north room that has all sorts of dashboards and scorecards up on the walls, and they go in and regularly visit this and watch the metrics move. Not in real time, but you have to put up a new picture. Yeah. Okay. Daily accountability process, so daily meetings to uh, identify variance and process performance, identify what improvements are needed, and create action plans. Sort of the last area is discipline. So it's not really an area all by itself, but it's like being dedicated to the whole thing uh, and applying um, these three core elements on a really regular basis. So that's what's in lean management. And so the lean leadership program was developed at, within Johns Hopkins. Laura Winner is a colleague of uh, mine and, and previously of Sally's, uh, at, specifically at the Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center. Uh, which is a 440-bed academic hospital that's in East Baltimore. Um, they did a 12-week cohort program to train a set of leaders in uh, lean leadership concepts. Um, and there were both didactic sessions, and then they alternated that with applied experiential learning sessions every other week with a lean expert coach, and it was actually uh, conducted on the unit. So again, remember those basic functions that I had uh, mentioned, you can see how those are being incorporated into this leadership uh, program. So here's the logic model essentially with the purpose to improve hospital unit leadership through the adoption of lean management practices. Um, the inputs included lean subject matter experts, lean management curriculum, uh, cohorts of these leaders, time, uh, and supportive leadership, meaning bosses of bosses. Uh, and then activities included these five didactic sessions over 12 weeks and then that experiential learning portion. And the, the outputs were uh, observed to be things like unit huddle boards, visual displays on the unit of performance metrics, daily staff huddles to review unit performance, um, problem solving, and the Kaizen activity. Um, and the hope was that the effects essentially would be greater visibility and interaction with leadership, visibility of unit operations, and improved staff perception of management. Um, this is all done with that recognition again that the context is going to vary. Uh, the context is going to vary. Okay. So here's what they did. Um, they did a baseline safety culture assessment, which was used and then compared to a 2017 safety culture assessment. So when I get to the next page and tell you that we weren't able to detect an effect, you will not be shocked because we didn't have very proximate measurements to uh, the actual intervention. But the lean leadership program was done with two cohorts, as you can see, and there were two units leadership included in each one of those cohorts. So the findings to date. Um, the difference in difference effects uh, in perceptions of management um, were not found, uh, so that's not shocking. But they do feel that they're seeing some benefit at Johns Hopkins with the use of this unit level huddle board, which is um, continuous and has uh, continued to um, occur or be used. Um, and the program still needs further testing and evaluation through experimental design. Um, but the current efforts are underway for us to develop a good survey to try to assess lean management as perceived at the organization, group, and individual levels. So another one I wanted to briefly discuss is the Health Equity Learning Network. This is part of the Center for Health Equity. And uh, it's system level leaders, not ones that are actually in a vertically integrated system, but this is more of a horizontal um, collaboration. There's leaders of primary care systems that come together by webinar and teleconference for didactic sessions, interactive discussions, and team-wide coaching. 
Um, so I'm going to skip a couple of slides. This is part of the Rich Life study, um, which is a cluster randomized trial uh, to improve blood pressure management. And we have 30 practices in Maryland and Pennsylvania who are participating. So the system level piece of this, or the leadership piece of this, is a health equity leadership network workshops, which are the quarterly face-to-face -face or web-based sessions that pre feature brief didactic presentation and interactive exercises and discussions. And then we have coaching calls in each of the months between the uh, didactic session. Um, and so it's meant to really give the leaders of the organization a chance to talk to the members of their own teams in the intensive condition uh, who are trying to implement blood pressure uh, improvements in blood pressure measurement and management. Uh, and so the idea is you train, hopefully, we're training the system level leaders in equity uh, topics uh, and management topics, and then they're using those in their interactions with their own on the phone during our coaching calls. Um, so some of the best practices in healthcare equity that we um, use to try to modify a pre-existing management training um, were included and reported by uh, Marshall Chin, and so I won't go into these, but here are the topics just to give you a sense of what the uh, overall program looks like. Um, we start out in the first module really trying to learn more about health disparities and equity, um, and around the fifth session or so, we had to do a, a quickie training on the change in the guidelines for blood pressure um, management, so <laughs> we stuck that one in there. Um, and then had some practical strategies about addressing health disparities and health equity. We then went into principal topics and leadership to enable health equity. And so we teach a basic leadership topic or a basic management topic, and then we try to provide examples that really deal with um, equity situations or, or improving equity within your own organization. And then finally, active, activating your role as a system level leader um, sustainment, advocating for change, and shaping the future will be the final module uh, in, our, in our health equity leadership network. Well, hopefully um, these examples that I've given you have shown you a sort of a light dose, a medium dose, and, and a heavy over time dose um, so that you have some ideas for your own work and you can uh, figure out which kind of approach you might be actually able to fit in again, to the context of probably a large-scale clinical intervention that you're also trying to get done at the same time. So thank you. So we'd like to invite the panelists up to the table for any questions, and as they're coming up, if people want to come to the mic. I think Brian Weiner from University of Washington. Not so much a question, but more of a comment. I think with these, uh, either the multi-level interventions or implementation strategies that we're testing, or those that are targeting higher levels within a healthcare delivery system, um, these talks have just reinforced for me the importance of really looking at the mechanisms by which these take place. And they're often linked through multiple mechanisms in a serial sort of mediation way because the effects are filtered through different processes. And it's hard to know when you just do something at the top and you look for some outcome at the bottom, where in that chain the transmission of the effect broke down and there was a voltage drop such that, uh, you know, we just don't know exactly sort of what happened here. And so these things really make me think that we really need to think those pieces through. But that also reinforces the notion that we have to have really good a theory of the intervention to have at least some hypothesis about how these interventions or implementation strategies actually work, um, not only to identify the function, but I think to, um, to be able to look in these complex causal chains where that, where that action is uh, being transmitted and where it's not. Go ahead, Doug. Hey, um, I don't know what's the on the panel, but I'm Doug Corley from Kaiser Permanente. Um, I, uh, this has been really interesting being able to integrate a lot of the 
mechanisms for the theories. And um, I think a number of people were at the, the embedded research meeting in Southern California. Uh, I one of the things I thought that was really interesting with that meeting was that there were, were also a number of people who were the operational leaders who kind of said, yeah, this works, that doesn't. And I'm just curious, within your organizations or within your settings, is there um, the equivalent of kind of embedded researchers who are the folks who kind of know the theory but are actually embedded within the operations as opposed to what a lot of us do, which are kind of like evaluating these things and then kind of trying to be able to help them, you know, you know kind of in a separate, in a separate silo, um, you know, be able, to, be able to kind of implement what the best practices are. I don't know, maybe if just, I mean, if it'd just be, it would be interesting to understand how many systems that type of thing is actually involved, if there's any models for that that are actually working um, or in practice. very heterogeneous, diffuse organization. And so there are folks who do that. I think one of the things we're working on is trying to um, get better information and, uh, you know, sort of shared methods. Uh, but I, I would say that even within the organization, those types of folks m may not be working together effectively. So there are, like, different shops of the operational folks who each have their sort of own agenda or way of doing measurement, and they don't talk to each other either. Uh, so within Johns Hopkins, within the Armstrong Institute in particular, um, the idea is to bring researchers together with operational folks. Uh, and in fact, there are, at the higher levels of the organization, people have shared titles within the healthcare system as well as within the sort of research side uh, of the institute. Um, going forward, uh, one of the goals of the institute will be to spend a, just 20% of its overall research effort towards operational priorities. And so those will have to be, we have to come up, we, we're not quite there, but we have to come up with a systematic way to, to identify what organizational priorities actually are and then be supporting from uh, using the faculty that are part of the Armstrong Institute research side. So that's a goal. Um, a few years ago, I did a series of site visits in the Minneapolis area to learn more about embedded researchers. Uh, and this actually would be more than a few years ago now, but it was during one of the years when the Academy Health was in Minneapolis, so probably somebody will remember the, the year. And uh, uh, I went to visit Alina and Medica, both had research shops within them. And then, of course, there's uh, another one called, I think, Health partners that um, is, a ta is really long term, like has been around since the 90s. Uh, and so we did some sort of site visits to those to learn more about the embedded researcher model. And um, uh, so it exists. But I think but since then, both the Medica and the Alina shops have closed. So it's hard to do. Part of the problem is that if a person is a researcher with an, and, and they're interested in an academic career, and it can be very hard for them to be in the operational setting um, where the priorities are dictated to the, in, to the researcher, sort of, and, and so that can be difficult. Of course, it's, it would be nice to have, you know, a 100% hard money job, too, but um, then you give up a little bit of control over your topic areas. So that's one of the problems. Any other comments? Not then. One more question? Hi, so I'm David Hagstrom at Indiana University and the VA. So um, the question I had was related to, in a lot of our framework, uh, um, the community as an, a layer, an outer layer there, although I think most of our discussion is focused on the organization. But looking at a lot of the process measures that, that um, have been focused upon, which reminds me of maybe the pos paucity of our quality measures, but things like cancer screening, follow-up of abnormal results, some of those process measure outcomes could be a function of lack of access. People are in the community but not being seen by the healthcare organization or, or moving to another healthcare organization. So, um, you know, how we 
uh, frame these questions, if we look from the organizational perspective, as probably many are familiar, the organization tends to focus on people who come into its doors as opposed to the community. So um, what are some of your thoughts regarding, you know, maybe integrating community with organizational frameworks and So um, from Parkland, um, we, we analyzed some of our cervical data. 70% of our cervical cancers um, walked in um, to our clinic. Um, so they had no contact with the Parkland Health and Hospital System in the 3.5 to 4 years prior um, to becoming, becoming and getting diagnosed. Um, and so that really kind of spoke to your, your point of, uh, what is the point of having a safety net system if it's not engaging the population that's at high risk for, highest risk for developing cervical cancer? Um, and, and what are we doing to help raise the profile of, of engaging in preventive services um, and improving our opportunity? Now, that does mean that 30% of the cervical cancers did arise in care settings, so there is still work to be done among those who um, might be, you know, highly comorbid and constantly using the healthcare system, but some odd reason are not prioritizing uh, preventive uh, services. I think the interventions for both of those are very different um, and, um, and would vary in terms of the extent to which it's engaging community organizations and, and other um, partnering organizations. So uh, we're actually working on a different project that uh, is joint with um, uh, Tracy Battaglia at BMC and Stephanie Lemon at UMass Worcester and Karen Freund at Tufts. It's sort of a um, conglomeration of the four Massachusetts uh, CTSAs, and it started with a community-based organization, the Boston Breast Cancer Equity Coalition. Um, and uh, Boston is a city with huge disparities in breast cancer outcomes. Uh, and one of the hypotheses for why that is is that we know that women move around between medical care facilities. So even once they're engaged with a healthcare system, you know, they lose their insurance, they, you know, decide to shop around, they something interferes. And you know, I think as a healthcare organization, once you know or once you think that someone's going someplace else, you sort of feel like you're not responsible for them, even if they never get to the new receiving organization. So we've been working with community coalition. We've been trying to develop a shared informational system across these medical um, systems that don't have shared information technology platforms and come up for some sort of standards of uh, patient navigation and communication across organizations. Um, and it's been a challenge. I mean, I think uh, you know, I think you talk about vertically integrated, you know, sort of alignment within vertically integrated organizations, uh, trying to get alignment between, um, com you know, competing organizations that are competing for market share um, is a very complicated thing to do. All right. Thank you very much to the panelists.